The walls of the city of Jerusalem were mere rubble. This news made Nehemiah very sad, so Nehemiah began to rebuild. He led the people day in and day out. Enemies attacked, but they overcame. God helped them finish the work in only 52 days. The Jews who had once been in captivity now returned home. Change your world in 52 days. The story of Nehemiah. Hey, good morning. How you doing? Yeah. Uh, I'm so glad to be with you again. If uh, you and I haven't had a chance to meet, my name is Aaron. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at the church. I'm excited uh, for you to know that Pastor Dave and Becca are back. They got home safely from their trip to Europe, and we're excited about that. And uh, you might see them floating around a little bit today, kind of greeting some people and having a good time. And, uh, but he'll be back preaching, finishing out this series that we're in next Sunday. And uh, it's just going to be totally awesome. And I also just want to say real quick, because I, I might forget at the end, but uh, Curtis Parks, a uh, good friend of mine who was leading worship today, uh, did you enjoy that? That was good. And Friday night, just so good if you were able to make it out on Friday night for our worship night. But um, you can meet Curtis out in the lobby uh, he's got a, a table out there, and he's an awesome book on worship that he wrote. And uh, I, it's so good. I, I actually bought one for uh, all of the people in our creative department, uh, musicians and techs, just to bless them because of their serving, especially in the area of worship. But you want to stop back there. He's got a, a worship album back there with original worship songs he's written, as well as a kid's worship album. That's cool, right? And uh, so moms and dads, you might want to check that out, which is, which is cool. So we're in week four of Change Your World in 52 Days. And um, my wife said something to me the other day after last week's message. Um, she said, why is it that you start every sermon off talking about your dogs? And I'm like, guilty. Like, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, and she's like, you talk about dogs and you make fun of cats. She's like, you know, like, this is a problem. So today, I just wanted to talk about how when I grew up, I actually had a cat. And um, I loved the cat. He was awesome. Um, he ended up getting stuck in a, in a trap one day, and so he had to have a leg amputated, and so I had a three-legged cat is really the, the moral of the story. Um, and, and then he ended up passing away, and then I had another cat, and the same exact thing happened to him. How many people can say when you were a kid you had two three-legged cats? No, like seriously, like, like I'm just, you know, and so for all of you people out there that think that maybe I hate cats, I don't hate cats. I really, I just, I just don't like them. And... Um, because, I mean, I was traumatized as a child. But I, I will say this. It didn't matter whether the cat had four legs or three legs. You would have never known the difference because nothing stood in the way of that cat or those cats doing whatever they wanted to do, going wherever they wanted to go, you know, like jumping up on anything they wanted to do. It just didn't matter. And so it was actually quite amazing, you know, like, like how, how well they could function even with, like, the disability that they had. Okay. Pastor Aaron, this is what some of you are thinking right now. What does this have to do with Nehemiah? Okay, nothing, actually. Really, it's, I just wanted you to know that I, I'm, I'm okay with cats. Like, I'm, I just wanted you to, But no, no, okay, let me make a really weak comparison here, just for those of you that feel like everything has to be on point. Um, we're going to get to chapter 4 of Nehemiah today, right? And, and this is the chapter where the people that were so excited to build the wall start to get a little discouraged because they're dealing with all the obstacles and all the opposition and they're dealing with all of the negativity and basically all the things that are standing in their way, right? Uh, and and lame, lame illustration, I get it, you know, but even my three-legged cats could figure out how to accomplish whatever they wanted to accomplish when they put their mind to it. Now, now here's where Nehemiah's at. Let me give you the context just real quick. Maybe you missed a week. Uh, maybe you're not real super familiar with Nehemiah. Maybe you're here for the first time. And, and you're just like, I, they talk about cats, three-legged cats in this church. Okay, just stay with me for a second. Okay. Nehemiah, here's the setting, 444 B.C., right? Uh, the, the nation of Israel is in ruins, specifically the city of Jerusalem, because the Persian Empire had come in many years before. They had torn down the wall. They left the city in ruins. Some people they took with them to another country. Some people they left there. There's a man by the name of Nehemiah. Everyone say Nehemiah. A man by the name of Nehemiah, he has been working for 20 years as the cupbearer to the king, King Artaxerxes. The cupbearer was the dude who poured the wine for the king, taste tested it first to make sure it wasn't poisoned, no assassination plots here, then give it to the king, right? Nehemiah finds out, he's originally, his ancestry is from the Jewish people. He finds out that his homeland is in ruins 
And Pastor Dave talked about this in week one and two. And he sits down and he weeps and he rises up and he takes action and he prays and he knows how to pray. And he knows why to pray and he knows when to pray. And then last week we talked about how Nehemiah had a plan, how he had a purpose, and how he had a life mission statement that he wanted to accomplish, right? So here, this is all the backstory, right? So Nehemiah goes to the king. He's like, king, the same king, mind you, that had determined that the city of Jerusalem would never be rebuilt has a soft place in his heart for Nehemiah because Nehemiah has been his bodyguard, really, for 20 years. And, and so Nehemiah goes to him and he says, hey, king, you know, could you, would you let me leave? Let me go build, rebuild the wall. The king says, go do it. Nehemiah says, by the way, could you give me some free lumber so I can rebuild the wall, rebuild the temple, build myself a house. The king's like, yep, you can do it. Hey, king, can I have the corporate credit card? <laughs> Would you pay for the whole thing? The king's like, yeah, sure, here you go. Just, here's, here's the unlimited American Express card. You can just do it all. Nehemiah jumps in an Uber, 1,000-mile trip. The king pays for the whole thing. He's listening to Life is a Highway, like, on repeat for, like, days, right? And he's getting there. He gets there. He goes out at night for three days. He evaluates what's going on. And then he, and we talked about this at the end of last week's message, he passionately persuades everybody. And he says, it's going to be awesome. We're going to rebuild the wall. Rah, it's going to be so good, right? And then they start rebuilding, right? I don't, I don't know. Have, did you ever have a moment in life where you feel like, I'm ready to do something. I'm going to do something great. You start making the sacrifices that are necessary to do it, thinking that because you made a sacrifice that God would make it simple for you, but it just didn't work out that way. Anybody with me? This happens all the time. He, you know, um, it's, it's really interesting because sometimes this is our, our thought process. When we talk about things like elevate one day and write a life mission statement and, and you're going to do something great with your life, this is, this is kind of naturally what we think. We think if I'm going to do something great for God and I'm going to make some sacrifices, if I'm going to, you know, you students in the room, I'm going to go start a Bible club at my school and I'm going to win my football team to Christ and you college students, you're like, man, I'm going to, I'm going to study so I can start a nonprofit and I can make a difference for people in this world and moms and dads and on and on the list could go, but we say, I'm going to do something great for God. And then when it's difficult to actually do what we think God told us to do or what we know God told us to do, then we're kind of like, what's going on here? Like, why am I experiencing all this opposition? Like, why is it hard? Like, like if I'm making the sacrifice, why is it not simple? This is what we're going to find out today in, in Nehemiah chapter 4. But see, here, here's the word. I just want to encourage you with this. It was one big thought right here at the beginning, right? All right? This verse right here, 1 Peter 5, 8, it says this, Be alert and be of sober mind, because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. devour. Yeah, I said that right. You have an enemy. And when you set out to do something great for God, there's an enemy who also sets out to bring opposition to what you're trying to do. The Bible says he's like a roaring lion, right? I just want to point out right here that um, a lion is a part of the cat family. And so there is a connection between <laughs> Satan and cats here. Just, I don't, I'm, no, I'm so, I'm so sorry. But, but the Bible says that when you set out to do something great, the devil sets out to counteract what you're doing. Um, this is, here, think of it like this. The devil isn't playing checkers with you. He's playing chess. And when you set out to make a move, a strategic move in your life to say, I'm going to do something great for God, then the devil's like, oh, I'm going to counteract that. Oh, I'm going to block that. Oh, I'm going to try to set you up for failure. I'm going to try to lure you into a trap so I can, I can get you in a checkmate situation. Right? Here, here's what's really going on. You and I face opposition because we're doing something right, not because we're doing something wrong. Right, for some, see, that was worth the price of admission for some of you right there. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm doing something right. Yeah, that, that's, that's why the devil's coming after me. I'm doing, look at your other neighbor, the one you just ignored again, two weeks in a row, two weeks in a row. And, and, and just th say this to them, you're doing something right. I saw, I saw this one guy over here look at the wall. He just like, he's like, I just want to make sure that the acoustic panels over there are okay. You're doing something right, you know. For some of you, that's what you needed to hear today. Man, I'm doing something right. That's the reason why there's opposition. That's the reason why there's struggle. That's the reason why, why something's coming after me. That's the reason why stuff is going on. There's an enemy prowling around like a three-legged cat who's coming after you, and he's just saying, man, because you're doing something right, I'm coming after you. 
All right, so let me take you to the story here real quick because you're going to learn some stuff here in, in, in Nehemiah about how the enemy wants to discourage us, right? There's really two ways in Nehemiah chapter 4, there's two ways that the enemy chooses to discourage us, right? Here's the first one, right? The outside voice. There's the outside voice. There's the voice of, of opposition. There's the voice of, of, of obstacles, right? There's the voice that's coming after us, right? And then there's the inside voice. That, that's the voice that uh, you and I live with in here, right? That's, that's the one you can't escape. That's the one who welcomes you in the morning, and you're like, oh, you're back. Oh, you're not welcome in my brain, but there you are once again. Okay, let's go to the text here. Here we go. Let's talk about this real quick. Here's the, here's the outside voice. This is the outside voice from the book of Nehemiah chapter 4. When Sanballat heard, he, he's like a political leader in the, in the country, not a Jewish leader. He was a Samaritan, right? When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, this is Nehemiah writing. That's why he says we. When he heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry. He was greatly incensed, and he ridiculed the Jews, right? This is the outside voice. It goes on. And in the presence of his associates and in the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Because the Jews didn't want to just rebuild the wall. They wanted to rebuild the temple so they could reinstitute their form of worship, Old Testament form of worship, right? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from these heaps of rubble? Burned as they are, this is Sanballat, this is, this is the voice of opposition. Then Tobiah, I guess he's like the sidekick, dude. Tobiah the Ammonite who was at his side, oh, there it is, he is the sidekick. He said, what are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it would break down their wall of stones. Okay, let me just stop here real quick. If, if I was Sanballat and I had just got done with some really, really good juicy like trash talk, and then my right-hand guy, Tobiah, is like, yeah, man, even a fox would break it down. No, I'm like, like I would just, I'd just stop and be like, dude, that, that's the best you got. Like, seriously, like, I'm throwing down world-class trash talk on the Jewish people right now, and you got a fox. <laughs> you, you ever see the movie Anchorman, where, where they're making fun of the dude's suit, right? And it's like really good stuff, and then the one guy's like, yeah, would you get your suit? The toilet store? And everyone's like, bro, like, come on. Like, that's the best that you got. Like, like, or it's like, it's like Sandlot, right? It's like the movie Sandlot when the two baseball and Porter's talking trash on the other baseball team. And the one dude's just like, you bob for apples in the toilet and you like it. And then, and then it's like king of all junior high trash talk. You play baseball like a girl, right? If you need to go watch that movie. It'll, for some of you will get saved just watching Sandlot. Uh, this is that moment. This is, this, is, this is Tobiah, and he's just, like, trying to jump in on the action, and everyone's like, bro, just stop. You got a fox. Like, you couldn't even come up with a better animal. Like, seriously, right? Okay, but, but this is the outside voice of criticism, right? And this is, this is what the outside voice does. The outside voice brings obstacles to you. The, the outside voice says, I'm going to point out all of the obstacles that you're going to face. Hey, you got to rebuild the wall. Hey, you got to rebuild the temple. Hey, do you think you're going to actually be able to do this with the time that you have to work on, with the limited resources that you have? Do you know how hard this is going to be? Th this is going to be really, really difficult for you and I. Like, this is the moment where, where you set out with some motivation. You're like, I'm going to do something great. I'm going to get my family out of debt. And then a week after that, every vehicle and appliance that you own breaks and needs to be replaced. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you're just like, what? You know, I'm going to go, I'm finally going to get on a stage and I'm going to sing a song. And then you get the flu and you lose your voice for like a month straight. You're like, what happened? It's obstacles. You're doing something right or you're trying to do something right. And so the, the devil's playing chess with you and he comes after you. And it's because you're doing something right that you're experiencing all the, look at your neighbor and say, I'm doing something right. I'm doing something right. I'm doing something right. Here, here's the second thing. Opposition. You get obstacles, you get, you get opposition. In this case, the opposition comes from the, the critical words that are sent from Sanballat and his associates and Tobiah, his right-hand trash talk guy, right? And, 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 and they're just saying, you know, we're going to oppose you publicly. We're going to ridicule you. We're going to mock you. This is the voice that every time a student in this room says, you know what, I'm going to stand up for Christ in my school I'm going to start a Bible club, and all your friends are like, dude, you're a freak. Like, dude, what's wrong with you? Like, what you, this is the voice that every one of you that have ever said, I'm going to leave 
the security of my job so that I can launch out and start a brand new business that I've had a heart to start for a long time. And everyone around you is like, dude, you're crazy. You're nuts. What's wrong with you? Right? This is the voice that for every one of you parents, every one of you moms, or every one of you dads who's actively at home raising your kids, this is the voice that says to you, why are you wasting so much time? You could have had a great career. You could go out and make a bunch of money, but you're stuck at home taking care of your kids. This is, this is that voice. It's the voice of opposition, and I'm telling you where it comes from. It comes from the enemy who is looking at what you're trying to do that is right and is saying to you, I'm going to do everything I can to put obstacles in your way and to bring opposition into your life. I'm going to do everything that I can do. So what's Nehemiah's response, right? What's Nehemiah's response? Let me tell you first what he doesn't say. Nehemiah doesn't stand up in front of the people who are trying to actively build the wall and say, oh, my gosh, guys, they're being mean to me. Oh my goodness, did you just say that? That hurts so bad. Oh, can someone bring my blankie to me and let me, let me just, let me roll. I just want to, I want to, I want to curl up in the fetal position real quick. Can someone rub my back? I just need a back rub right now. I just need a, I'm sorry. I'm not making fun of any, any one person in particular. If anything, I'm making fun of myself because my wife is like, that is so you actually. <sighs> this, that's not what Nehemiah does. This is what Nehemiah does. Check out, check out the text here real quick. This is Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 4. four. He's writing, hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. He's basically saying, let the little fox run on top of their own head, you know, Mr. Tobiah there, right? Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt. He, you know what, he's, he is praying mean right now. Did you know that you're allowed to do that sometimes? I'm, I'm serious. When the devil comes after you, you're allowed to, no, not today. No, 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 not today, Mr. Enemy, Mr. Mr. Cat. Not today, right? Now, you, can, you can pray mean every once in a while. Not on another person, because the Bible says we're supposed to love our enemies. But you're allowed to pray mean on the obstacles and the obstacles that come your way. He's praying mean on them. Don't cover their guilt. Don't blot out their sins from your sight. For they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. And so we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half of its height, and the people worked with all of their heart. Let me, let me translate for you what just happened here with one of my favorite quotes, because this is basically how Nehemiah responded to the outside voice, to the voice of obstacle, to the voice of opposition. This is what he did. You pray like everything depends on God, and you work like everything depends on, well, it's supposed to say you. That's my fault, because I actually made this keynote. You pray like everything depends on God, and you work like everything depends on you. Let me say it like this. Let me say it like this. Someone comes after you. The devil starts messing with you, right? You're trying to do something well, and then there's obstacles, and then there's opposition. Here's what you got to do. you got to take it to God and get back to work. Take it to God and get back to work. Look at your neighbor and say, take it to God and get back to work. I, you got to get back to work. you you got, you got to, you got to be focused on the mission. A bunch of you are going to come to Elevate one day on May the, May the 12th, right? May the, yeah, May the 12th. You're going to come to Elevate one day. You're going to walk out of that little half-day conference. You're going to walk out of that, and you're going to be like, oh, I am so lit up right now. I am so passionate about my purpose. And you're going to start pursuing it just like Nehemiah did. And then there's going to be an obstacle. Then there's going to be opposition. Then there's going to be voice of criticism. And what do you have to do? Take it to God and get back to work. What do you need to do? Take it to God and get back to work. What do you need to do? Take it to God. You're going to remember this one way or another. I'm going to make you tattoo this on your arm. you got to take it to God, and you got to get back to work. You know, um, last week, um, last weekend on Saturday, my wife and I, we did our annual conference for training youth leaders that we do um, down at the University of Valley Forge. And uh, every, every year after the conference, we send an email out to everybody who came. And in the email, we have a little survey of like 10 questions for them to fill out. And I, and I send it out because I'm like, I want to get some feedback from people. But here's what I really want. I'm just going to be really transparent with you. What I really want is I want people to write me back and tell me how amazing it was. Don't laugh because some of you are the same way. <laughs> but not everybody does that. And so, you know, like, so when all the results come rolling back in, I'm like, I'm like oh, yeah, I want to read the results. And I click on it and I'm kind of like, 
and I'm scrolling through because I, like, I want to get the good stuff, like the words of affirmation, because that's like my love language, right? I want all the good stuff. It was awesome. It was incredible. It changed my life. Oh, my God. You know? And then, but then there's always, yeah, there's always that one person. The music was too loud. I'm pretty sure it was at 130 decibels in there, and, 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 and I'm, I'm really upset. And I'm thinking, if it was 130 decibels, your ears would have been bleeding. It really wasn't that loud, I promise. You know, I, I just wish that, yeah, the, the preachers had used more scripture verses in the sessions. And um, I, just, I just thought that the worship really wasn't honoring God. I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you did not. No. But, but this is how it works. There's always going to be a voice of criticism. Some of you are like, really, Pastor Ann, really? Like, like, people criticize you? Does the sun rise in the morning? Will the Giants have another losing season? Will the Steelers win the Super Bowl next year? Yeah, um, come on. I mean, listen, if you're going to do anything great for God, guess what? People are going to criticize you. And what do you do? Take it to God, get back to work. You take it to God, and you get back to work. That's the outside voice. But then there's this other voice. And for most of you in the room, if you're like me, this voice is even harder to deal with because this is the inside voice. This is that voice that you live with. And it's like Spotify on repeat, the same song. And it's not a good song. And it's this negative pattern of thinking that you maybe inherited from one of your parents or, or it's this negative, on-repeat cycle of all of the negative words that people have said to you or about you. And you just listen to them over and over and over and over again. Here's what happened to the, the Jews that were helping to rebuild the wall. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 10. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength. Now, they said this of themselves. This is not outside voice. This is inside, inside rhetoric going on right now. The strength of the laborers is giving out. And there's so much rubble. We cannot rebuild the wall. That's the inside voice. I can't do it. It's too much work. The sacrifice is going to be too great. It's too hard. I'm too tired. I'm not good enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm not strong enough. I just can't do it. You know what this is? This is what I call us being insecure and us being overwhelmed. They're insecure. I can't do it. I don't have what it takes. I'm not a builder. I don't, I don't have, it's just, like, I'm not good enough. I'm not gifted enough. I've never done this kind of work before, trying to put a wall back together again. I don't work with tools. I don't with my hands. I, like, type on keyboards or I use my thumb on my phone. I'm really good with my thumbs. I'm great with social media and Instagram. I'm not good at rebuilding a wall, right? They're insecure or they're overwhelmed. It's too much. How many miles of wall is this? How many gates need to be rebuilt plus the temple needs? It's too, I can't get it done. You know, I, I shared with um, the church last week that um, I have a, my very first book is being released next Sunday, right? I'm super excited about it, and, um, and, but, but I shared this with the church, right? And, and you can check it out here. It's, it's, it's launching next Sunday. You can go on the website, mypsalm23.com. Um, you can actually download a free chapter today if you want to kind of get a head start on it. Um, but when I was writing the book, I'm telling you, I got insecure and I got overwhelmed because I had never written a book before. I had always wanted to do it. Just like the people in Jerusalem for 140 years who had lived in ruins and thought to themselves, wouldn't it be great if we rebuilt the wall one day? I had always wanted to write a book. They had always wanted to rebuild walls. But, man, I'm telling you, I got about two or three chapters in, and, I was, and I'm, the mind games, the inside voice just kicked in. And it's just like, I can't do this. I've never written a book before. I don't know what I'm doing. I barely passed English in high school. I, can't, I don't know whether the period goes before or after the quotation mark. Like, I'm not even sure. Like, how in the world can I write a book, you know? And, and I'm, I'm telling you, and then, and then I started to think about how much work I had in order to get it done by the time that I wanted to get it done. And, and, and at one point, I quit. And then I had an old college buddy that I, we used to play basketball together in college, and we, we had reconnected, and so we were talking, and, um, and I was telling him, I had mentioned to him that I, was, that I enjoyed writing. I didn't want to tell him that I was writing a book. I just mentioned, like, yeah, I enjoy writing. And he was like, oh, cool, what are you writing? And I was like, yeah, you know, just every once in a while. He's like, no, what are you writing? So I started to tell him what I was writing. And I'm real bashfully, real just like, yeah, I'm writing this book. And, you know, Psalm 23. And it's probably really bad. And it's not going to be any good. And blah, blah, blah. And, and he was just like, won't you send it to me? 
and what, what you got? And I was like, okay, I'll send it to you, but like, it's like, seriously, like, it's going to be really bad. It's going to have a ton of typos in it. The grammar's going to be terrible. It probably doesn't even make any sense at all. What is that? I'm insecure. I'm overwhelmed. He, he writes me back, and he, and, and he says to me, I don't care what you have to do, and I don't care how hard you have to work, but you have to give your entire heart to getting this done because people need to read what you've already written and also what you're going to write. That, that's what Nehemiah is saying to the people. He, he's saying to them, listen, work. He's saying, take it to God and get back to work. I know there's this voice in your head that's saying, I can't do it. I can't figure it out. For all of you young adults in the room and all of you high schoolers that are getting ready to graduate high school this year, next year, right? There's this voice in you that's saying, I'll never figure out what it is that I want to do with my life. That's what Elevate One Day is all about. That's why I'm pushing you so hard these last two messages to say, go to the website, elevateoneday.com, and register so that it's free. Go, go online. You can do it. I give you permission to go on your phone right now. I promise. I promise. Okay? Right? You can go register, and, and you're going to discover your life mission. You're going to discover exactly what it is that God says, hey, this is what I want to do with you. Y you know, um, I don't have this verse, but just, just you, you know this one. John 10.10. Right? The enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come to give you life and give it to the fullest. Right? You know this verse? Right? 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 right. He, he's saying, I've come to give you a life of purpose and passion, a life full of contentment and fulfillment. But before Jesus says that, he says, the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. Now listen to this. Listen to this. Somebody's going to set somebody free here in this room right now. Right? Steal, kill, and destroy. Steal, kill, and destroy. The law of superpositioning says that the latter is greater than the former. Steal would be the former. The latter would be destruction. Steal, kill, and destroy. What, what, what does that mean, Pastor? And what are you even talking about? The law of superpositioning being greater and the former is greater than... Here's what it means. Here's what it means. Yes, the devil wants to steal from you. And yes, the devil ultimately wants to kill you. But you know what he takes great pride in, ju in doing? He takes great pride in destroying your life so that you live a miserable, unfulfilled life that makes no difference in this world. And you wallow in the ruins of your life like the Jews did for 140 years in Jerusalem. The devil's come to destroy all of the good things that can be produced from my life and from your life. And he uses the inside voice to say to you, who am I? I can't do that. How could I ever do that? I'm just a mom raising kids. I can't make a difference. I'm just a student. I'm just a teenager. I, I, I can't make a difference. I, I, I'm just a dude working a job somewhere trying to get a promotion and a raise. I can't make a difference. Listen, if you're going to do something great from God, there's going to be a voice in your head who says to you, you can't do it. And what do you have to do? Take it to God and get back to work. You got to take it to God and you got to get back to work. One more time. You got to. So how do you do it? How, how do you defeat the discouragement? How do, how do you do I'm going to give you two practical things real quick. They come right from the story uh, of Nehemiah, right? I'm going to wrap it up. We're almost done. Here's the first one. This is what Nehemiah does. He says, after I looked over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your home. I feel like this is like the William Wallace Braveheart theme song playing under here. Fight freedom. You know, he's just like, he's just not going to. But, but here, here's what he's doing. This is what he's saying. He's saying, how are you going to defeat discouragement in your life? How are you going to accomplish your Elevate One Day mission statement that you're going to write in a couple weeks? How are you going to do that? You have to remember your God. He says it like this. He says, remember the Lord your God. God, he, listen, listen, here's what Nehemiah is really talking about. I got to go, can I go Bible geek on you here for just like one minute, right? Okay, all right, all right. When he says the Lord, that's not a title, as in Lord Stanley, you're probably thinking Pittsburgh Penguins, they're going to three-peat again, like I totally get it, right? Right? You could have applauded for my team there if you want, okay. Uh, he's not, it's not a title, it's not, it's not Lord Stanley, it's not Lord Ian McClellan, it's, it's, not, it's not a title. Lord, in the Old Testament, is God's personal name. It's used over 5,000 times, and in the Hebrew language, it's most often translated into the word Yahweh. Everyone say Yahweh. Yahweh. Yeah. You, you're, you're actually more familiar with the word Yahweh than what you realize. Because Yahweh is two words that are jammed together. 
Yah, right? Yah and Halal. Yah and Halal. Yah is the shortened name for God, and Halal is the, is the shortened version of the word Hallelujah or Alleluia that we were singing about just a couple minutes ago, right? And so when Nehemiah says, remember the Lord, your God, the people immediately, all of a sudden, they're like, yes, the Lord, yes, Yahweh, the one who is and is to come. Yahweh, the one who has established truth for all people in all places at all times. Yahweh, the one who existed before time, the one who exists outside of time, the one who will always exist throughout time and beyond time. Yahweh, that one. And when they would use the word hallelujah, like we were just singing a minute ago, when they would use that word, it wasn't just, oh, praise God, which is literally what it interprets into. It wasn't, it, it was, it's back to the trash talk scene. Sand Ballot and Tobiah are like, man, who do you guys think you are? And this is what they say. They say, hallelujah, I praise God. I praise God. I praise Yahweh. I praise the one and true God. I praise the only God. I praise the God whose name is above all other names. I don't praise Baal. I don't praise Molech. I don't praise any of the other gods that people serve in that day. I praise the one true God. It was, a, it was their stake in the ground moment. And so when he says, listen, when, when Nehemiah says, remember your God, people are like, yeah, my God, the God. And you know what, I'm sure that if, if it was the New Testament, this is what Nehemiah would have sounded like. He would have said, remember that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Remember that no thing shall separate you from the love of God. Remember that if our God is for us, then who can be against us? That's what it would have sounded like. In the Old Testament, it sounds like this. Remember when our ancestors were slaves in the country of Egypt. And remember when God raised up a man named Moses to bring deliverance to them. And remember when Moses said, I can't talk. I have a bad voice. And God said, I gave you your mouth. Just say what I tell you to say. And Nehemiah, he would go on. He'd say, remember when Moses stood up in front of Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And then he said, and remember the ten plagues, and then people ran out to the sea, and then they were stuck in an obstacle. Red Sea on one side, mountains on the other side with the Egyptian army bearing down on them. And he said, remember how my God put up a wall of fire on one side and opened the sea on the other side so that people could walk through on dry ground again. Remember how the manna fell in the wilderness. God will always provide for you and your mission just enough to make it through each and every day. Nehemiah says, remember your God. And then he says this last thing, finishing it up right here. He says, remember your cause. What was their cause? Their cause was their children. Their cause was to restore honor to the people of Jerusalem. Their cause was to pass on to the next generation something better than the, what ha they had actually experienced and received themselves. One of my favorite quotes just off the top of my head, I don't, I don't have it prepared for you. One of my favorite quotes is the quote that says this. It says, discipleship is not imitation. Our sons must be better. Discipleship is not imitation. Our sons must be better. It challenges me as a father to look at my life and then look at the life of my son or my girls, my children, and say, true discipleship is when I lead them and guide them in such a way that their life will produce more than my life ever produced. And that they'll have a better relationship with God than what I experienced. I don't want them to just simply imitate me. I want to leave something for them that's better than what I experienced myself. That's how generational blessing flows from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. And these people in Jerusalem who had been living in ruins for 140 years had to come to grips with the fact that they were going to remember their God. And they were going to remember that their cause was so valuable and so great they were going to leave something better for the next generation. And they did. They did it. You know, I, I want to close. Just I want to give you one last thought. I think maybe last year sometime I might have shared this thought with some of you here at church. But I want to do it again because the Holy Spirit just kind of said, you, you need, someone needs to see this today. A lot of times when you and I are thinking about our life mission and we're thinking about um, where we want to go in our future college students, you young adults, you, you single adults who are still trying to figure out, like, what do I really want to do with my life? And maybe even some of you, you people in your middle age, and you're just thinking, like, a career change, or you're thinking, like, you know, what do I want to do? Or those of you that are getting ready to retire, and you're thinking, what do I want to do for the last decades of my life, you know, to make a difference? And so we always tend to face our future. Let's say this is our future, and that's our past. 
We always tend to face our future and we, we're thinking, I'm going to walk into my future. I'm going to face my future. I'm going to go. I'm going to step and I'm going to step and I'm going to step. And the challenge with that mentality is that there's so much unknown about the future, right? There's the, I don't know. You young adults in the room, you're like, I don't know what major to choose. I don't know what college to go to, right? You people are getting ready to retire. Like, I don't know. I don't know what sacrifices I should make. I don't know. There's unknown. There's uncertainty. Why? Because you can't see the future. You don't know the future. You're not omniscient like God is to where he knows all things. So this is a mistake to try to walk face first into my future. That, that leads me to a place of discouragement where the outside voice and the inside voice attacks me and convinces me to give up and just stay still. I, I call it the uh, paralysis of analysis because you just stand here like, I don't know, 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 I don't know. What do I do? 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 Jesus, just make it easy. Send me a text message and tell me where to go. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? That's not what Jewish people would do. And that's not what Nehemiah and his people did. They faced this way. And they looked at their past. They knew the future was to rebuild a wall and leave something better for the next generation, bring honor and glory back to the name of God in the city of Jerusalem. But instead of walking into their future, they, they back their way into the future, and this is what they say to themselves. I remember what my God did in the past. And I remember what he did for my grandfather, what he did for my father. I remember how he was faithful. I remember how he never failed. I remember that he always did the good thing. I remember that he provided. They remembered their God because they looked back and they said, I see what God has done in the past. And if he's done it in the past, then you can be sure he's going to do it back there. I don't even need to look and wonder whether he's going to do it. I saw what he did in the past. I know that he'll do it again in the future. I know he'll do it. I know he will. And then they would look back and they'd see their children that are walking behind them and they would say, I'm doing it for you and I'm doing it for you and I'm doing it for you. I'm walking into my future that way, but I'm doing it for you and you and you and I'm going to leave something behind that's greater than what I've experienced in this lifetime. I want to tell you, I want to remind you, when you hit the obstacles, and you will, remember your God and remember your cause. Take it to God and then get yourself back to work again. God's got a plan and a mission in your life. And if you're unsure of his faithfulness in your future, turn around and look at what he's already done in your life and recall all of his goodness and all of his faithfulness all across this room. Would you just stand to your feet right now? With hands lifted high, if you feel comfortable, with hands lifted high, would you just begin to recall and remember all of God's goodness in your life? Would you just right now open up your mouth and just thank God for what he's done in your past? Thank God for what he's accomplished for you in the past. And then remind him of how good he's going to be to you in your future. Come on, lift your voice.